You know, I've been a Christian a long time. And I like hearing certain kinds of messages. I like hearing these. What I just went to was a men's conference. And I like, you know, I understand this whole idea of telling men to get with it, get on with it, get doing it, and, you know, be more, act more. And the failure of something is because of men not being who they are. Not so sure that we always communicate the right ideas about what we're saying and doing. Oh, sure, we should always lift up the bar and make it higher. But I like to see where men are and talk to them about going farther. You see, sometimes men get beat up by their own bad ideas rather than the good ideas that are being promoted. Sometimes we take this example from scriptures and we try to say, oh, we should be like a Paul, or we should be like a Peter, or we should be like Jesus. And sometimes that gets distorted because, you know, you're not Paul. You're not Peter. As a matter of fact, you're probably doing the best you can if I sense the Holy Spirit in you. You're probably, you know, not the greatest, not the most wonderful, not the smartest, not the most intelligent. Matter of fact, you might be exactly what the disciples were. Because you see, we're talking about Jesus in a small country affecting a small amount of people at a peculiar time in history that God chose a certain number of people to communicate his kingdom to the rest of the world. And when we look in the book of Acts, we may see numbers like thousands, but no offense, I affect thousands in one minute as opposed to thousands that went through the day that everyone in a massive crowd showed up in Jerusalem. So there's this idea somehow sometimes that happens in reading the scripture that we blow out of proportion and make bigger the problems than what they are. Or we make bigger the results than what they are. Yes, God wants to do a work in your life. But he wants to work in you. Not millions, not billions, not thousands. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much more you do, you can't do enough when you look at the news or you look at your views of the world and its ways and you say, oh my God, the world's coming to an end, I gotta do something. No, you don't. You don't. We're told to commit our way unto the Lord, to trust also in Him and He'll bring it back. We're told to give it to God and let God lead us. You see, if you're doing your best and you pray that it's blessed, Jesus takes care of the rest. You need to chill out sometimes to let out the Spirit of God. In other words, I'm one of those kinds of people that, hey, you know what, I hear about a message saying, you know, we need to do more, and I want to go do more, and I, I have to take some time alone, you know, with God to say, boy, Lord, you know, I'm not really like those kind of people, you know. They all seem to have, you know, thousands of followers, or they all seem to have big cars, or, you know, they're all doing so much more than I. I'm nobody. You don't need somebody like me because I, I really don't, you know, have a mega ministry. I don't, I don't touch billions, you know, and I see the world like they said, you know, it's like, ooh, you know, oh my God, it's coming to an end. Oh God, what can I do? I need to do more. I need to do-do. And that's the point. You see, it is true. The world's coming to an end. There's nothing you're going to do to change that. It's a fact. It's a reality. That's the way it is. I'm sorry, but, you know, some of the men that God used dealt with those realities maybe better than what we're doing in modern evangelicalism today. Instead of being thankful and grateful for that with which we have and what a huge blessing we are, where we are, as we are, sometimes we get carried away and we want to do more and we think we're not radical like we want to make out someone else to be. You see, Paul went to the temple regularly over days and days and days. And then we hear about one incident and we think, oh man, we need to go to the temple, you know, so that we can do that every day. And you wind up seeing, no, it doesn't work that way. In the Lord's timing, God used certain incidences in people's lives 
to accomplish its purpose. But we look at that and we want to use that as an everyday occurrence. It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. Look at the Bible and read it. And recognize that in someone's life we're talking over the long haul, not isolated incidences. Oh, there's more that was accomplished in their life and there's less that we know about than what is recorded in the scriptures about any particular person. But what God chose to use, he also chose to teach us with. And when he does, we need to recognize who we're listening to as opposed to who's driving us. Because you see, there is a tendency in evangelicalism as well as in Christianity as a whole to push rather than to inspire. To push people to do more to push people to become more, to push people to be more. Because after all, that's what they're doing in their job, is they're pushing more, being more, doing more. Sometimes you got to be thankful for what you got and just let God do the rest. I minister to a lot of people who really go way out of their way and post all kinds of extra junk and stuff because they're guilt-ridden. They're being driven by unfortunately, wrong motivations. You see, God, when he uses something, can use quality over quantity. He doesn't necessarily want you every day to be constantly out there, you know, beating someone to death with your Bible. That's not what God said to do. He said rather to walk humbly, love mercy, and do justly. In other words, chill out so that God could fill out all of your life with his presence and he will draw men unto himself. If I lift up Jesus, if I'm just thrilled with my life, if I'm thrilled with the things that God is doing in my life, people are going to be attracted to me. They're going to come to me. They're going to say, what's different? If I'm happy in the midst of my trials, they're going to look at me and say, you're a nut. What are you, you know, what's going on? If they see something that I'm not all tweaked out about, then they realize, hey, you know, I'd like to have some of that peace. And that's where I think now, especially when supposedly we're less a Christian nation, which we've always been one, in other words, we've been a nation of Christians, not a Christian nation, or that supposedly now we're so bad, and I keep going, man, where were you in the 60s and the 70s? This ain't nothing compared to what I went through. Hey, I remember when the country was falling apart and they were calling out the National Guard to knock down and to shoot citizens. We aren't far from Kent State, you know, and Black Panthers and kind of like things that were being bombed in Washington, D.C. and things that were going on to L.A. riots. I mean, let's be real. There were a lot more things going on in the country back in the 70s and 60s than, oh my God, I'm so sorry that 9-11 happened, you know, and I'm glad that everybody can remember that. But I seem to remember that NAM was pretty serious too. You know, there were a lot of things happening back then that we went through and we got over. I'm happy that the East Coast, you know, and so many people from the West Coast, you know, get all wrapped up in one incident and can remember that. Oh my God, it was terrible. There were a lot of people that died back in the, you know, hey, Ku Klux Klan time, you know, and there were a lot of people dying, you know, all the time in America. Now, you know, we make even a hangnail sound like it's the worst end of the world scenario. Oh my God, God's sending me to hell because I've got a hangnail. No. In other words, don't let the distortion cause contortion in your faith. In other words, don't try to twist the scriptures because you want more from God. If you find yourself wanting, needing, being pushed, or stepping ahead of God, then you're really not doing the will of God in your life. You're really not accomplishing anything for anybody of any value or any worth because you're sweating, as Chuck Smith used to say, what God wants to do by you walking, talking, living out your life. The disciples in the long term of their life, you know, the book of Acts has a lot of history of the early church going on, but they assemble day after day after day after day after day after day after day with no real events recorded. They were encouraging one another, exhorting one another, and then they'll talk about an event. It isn't as though, you know, every day. When Paul went to a church you know, and established it for years being there, does it really get communicated often by pastors or teachers sometimes saying, look, he went to that 
area and stayed for two or three years to build up that body of believers. It wasn't like they walked into town and, oh my God, you know, everybody got saved. You record some incidences of things like that, where it's like, oh, you see the one incident where the crowd came out. Oh, wow, you know, look what happened. There's these guys, you know, that told me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so you hear about that. But the normal routine is normal. In other words, there isn't a constant every day, you know, this hype of do more, be more, say more. The reality of what we are is living day to day. That's what God wants from us. He wants to live with us, not push us, drive us, make us do more than what God wants us to do. And this may not be, you know, the best message that some people want to hear, but quite frankly, I got to say it because, you know, you're stomping on sometimes the people that would be helping you. You know, if you kind of like got together with a bunch of people and you said, hey, you know what? I've been feeling like, you know, we need to do something. So let's just, let's just pray about it. Kind of like what my church is doing right now. They're getting a bunch of men together and they're praying about it. You know, I, I'm assuming, you know, because I haven't been to their meetings, but I'm assuming they're not doing anything more than praying. And they're continuing to pray until they get a solid, concise, precise word to what to do. And I imagine they will accomplish the purpose that God wants for them. Now, for me, I spend, oh, I don't know, nothing but time in the ministry. Often, to the exclusion of my own personal you know, life in a lot of ways, you know, there's a lot of things I could be doing, you know, like watering the garden or cleaning the house or doing things that, you know, sure, I could enjoy it, participate in. I could give up Vivo and go to work, you know, and find a job somewhere, making pennies on the dollar, you know, and, and do something, you know, that, oh, then I'm fulfilling, you know, my manly role, you know, so to speak, you know, that sometimes that's what men look at is, well, what kind of job do you got? Well, what kind of job do you got? Do you have a Harley? No, I don't have a Harley. Do you have this? You know, no, I don't have that. What's your favorite football team? Oh, you're one of those, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's not my, my shtick. I'm sorry, you know, my, my idealism is my truism, is my factual reality of how I live my life. I get up in the day. I'm thrilled today to see what God is going to bring my way. I am looking forward to the sunrise as it comes up over the mountains of Sacramento, you know, or well, actually the Sierra Nevada, but then shines down on Sacramento. And I see and I go, Lord, wow, what a beautiful day you've made. This is your day. Can I do something for you? Can I participate with you in what you're doing? Can I see how you might use my life in some way to bring meaning and purpose and direction in someone else's life? God, what would you do today? And then I give him my life and say, Okay, Lord, yours. I'm all yours. Everything I am, everything I'm not, everything I will be, everything I could be. And God then uses me the way he wants to as opposed to the way I want to. Because... I told my wife before, you know, this simply. I said, hey, I love work. I love giving up the ministry. God knows, you know, the ministry is wonderful. I love enjoying the fellowship of the Spirit, God moving, His Holy Spirit doing things, you know, that are miraculous in my life. I see miracles every day. I see healings. I see, well, not every day, but most days. I see all kinds of weird things happening, you know, supernatural things, you know. Things that, to me, are natural for God, but some people don't notice them because they're so busy doing what they're doing. But... I also recognize I need to back up, to stop, to take a look at the Word, to recognize it's not all do, it's not all ministry, it's all being alive. It's being the kind of person that walks with God, talks with the Lord, that looks at our Savior and says, thank you at times, that says, I don't need to do more. If anything, sometimes I need to do less and let God do more. And that's where there's always this balance, you know, in what you're learning and what you're applying. You see, God wants to take your heart and change it into His. Oh, sure, it's good to have desires. Oh, I want the country to be saved. Well, you know, good. Praise the Lord. You know, God bless America, you know, and all that's going on in it, you know, and God, you deal with it because you know what? I can only do so much. You know, should I get involved in all these political issues? No, thank you. Tried that. Doesn't work. You go for it. 
You know, and if you want to spin your wheels, you know, go do that. Praise the Lord, go for it. If that's what you enjoy, if that's how God wants to employ you and your gifts for His kingdom, then go do what God tells you to do. But you see, that's what the issue is with each and every one of our lives. What is God telling you to do? What is the Holy Spirit of God inspiring you to do? Because as we walk in the Spirit, as we talk to the Lord in the Spirit, as we are led by the Spirit of God, then we prove and demonstrate that we are the sons of God, not by our accomplishments, but by our faithfulness to what God tells us to do. As the Lord leads us, we prove we are His disciples indeed. As we demonstrate the love we have for one another, He knows and the world reveals itself by its obvious shock and awe about who we love. You love your enemies? No. Why would you do that? Why did you go and help you know, those people that everyone else wanted to you know, crucify or chastise or beat up or throw in jail? Why did you go and pray for them? Why did you minister to them? Why did you still care when everyone else said, oh no, you need to you know, like get on the bandwagon and lock him up? Well, Simply because God said, you know, He loved the world, you know, and I don't understand it, but I'm going to pray for Him anyways, you know. And I usually pray for those that nobody will pray for, you know, kind of like the bomber, you know, the Boston bomber. Oh my God, that's the end of the world. No, it's not. It's, you know, two people that got caught up in peer pressure of what the stupid worldly ways are, you know, and tried to do something their way that was dumb in the first place, and they got caught up in a deception that wound up killing a lot of people. So I'll pray for their salvation. I don't want them to go to hell. I'd rather prefer that they deal with the reality of sin now and be forgiven of it so that they could go to heaven after they die. I prefer that every soul be found in Jesus. I prefer that every man of God share with every person who doesn't know God the reality of heaven and hell so they at least have a choice to make, so they have an opportunity for hope, so they have a perspective that they can say, hey, Yes, I did that which was abhorrent to society. I did blow up people. I did become a terrorist. But now I've become a radical person for Jesus. Because that's what Paul was. Paul was a terrorist. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Paul was even radical for, quite frankly, Jewish perspective. You know, he wasn't a zealot, per se, because the zealots would have killed Jews for Jews. But at that time, prior to the Herodians taking the temple, the Maccabean revolt was about radical Jews killing Jews in the name of God, which to me is like, you've got to be kidding me. We're talking the Inquisition, Jewish style. You know, killing in the name of faith because they're not following exactly what they, the priesthood, corrupted priesthood, Judah, uh, not Judah Maccabee, um, I think it's Ele Eliezer Maccabee, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But they, the high priest deciding that, you know, oh my God, you're becoming, you know, one of those, you know, corrupted Jews because you're, you know, not worshiping the Lord our God, so he kills them. So, no offense, no wonder God wasn't in the temple when they wanted to relight in Hanukkah, you know, the, the Holy Spirit supposedly giving them a miracle. No, he didn't. Wasn't there. Sorry. They invented it. And Jewish culture, Jewish historians, they know that the rabbis at the time invented Hanukkah because they had to hide the fact that God wasn't in the temple. Where did he go? What happened? Sin. And that's what we have to be careful of when we want to, as opposed to God tells us to, inspire others rather than cause them to perspire in doing more. There's often many people I watch in ministry working, 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 and sweating because they want to do more and they think they have to accomplish more more because they have some kind of guilt inside. When in reality, God just wants to bless them. God just wants to say, hey, look, you know that little bit that you got? Watch this. I'm going to make it great. You know that little bit that you did, that one person you touched? That's what I wanted you to do. I didn't want you to go out there you know, and start mega ministries. I wanted you to touch one person. Now, God blesses, and you know, you see all these mega things happen, you know, and you see these wonderful you know, extracurricular benefits you know, of being a Christian happen in a lot of people's lives where they're Oh, so bountiful, you know, they have, oh, lots of children, or they have, oh, lots of possessions. But 
we ought to dispossess ourselves of our own obsession with looking at the world and the world news and this exaggerated perspective of what America is or what you know different articles say or what different people tell us as opposed to what God says. And you know what God says today to you? God says, I'm in control. I got it. I'm doing it. I'm doing a work in you that you will not be... You, that I'm doing a work in you that you'll be so amazed that you'll be shocked at the results of how much you accomplished when you get to heaven. Man will look at often outward things and think they're doing the will of God. When God chooses to use those things you can't see, those things that aren't obvious, those things that don't bring an immediate reward like sitting in front of a video camera. I mean, hey, you know, there's an immediate reward. People notice and they go, oh, look at that, that's, that's Michael. Well, lost your reward, buddy, you know, do it in secret. And your father rewards you openly. Because that's really where it counts. The rubber meets the road not in what you can demonstrate by your Christianity. Oh, I'm a Christian, this is what I do. But rather what God sees you do in the everyday things of life. Do you love your wife? For her and for your children are you laying down your life? What about the other? Are you living as a servant to your sister and your brother? Do you make the poor man beg you for a bone? Do the widow and the orphan cry alone? In other words, is your heart caring about others? in a way that God wants to tenderize your soul. Because you may not be able to do more than you can do, but you can care about those with whom you can't do anything more than what you've done. And that's what God wants. He doesn't want you to go out and do something sometimes. He wants you to be something, a man of prayer. He wants you to be a person who says, yes, Lord, you take care of it, I can't. Yes, Lord, I want you to bless them. Yes, Lord, you know, you touch them. Yes, Lord, you go and do and heal them. No, it's not always about there being some kind of failure of the church, which I hear all the time. I'm so tired of people talking about how we got to do more. You know, quite frankly, there's more being done in Christianity today than ever was done in the world and its ways. I mean, bluntly, but that they're doing may not be what God is wanting them to do in these latter days. There are lots of things that need to be strengthened of those people that are blown out and burned out because they tried to go out and do things they weren't really ready to do. They're kind of like sheep that have like been pushed to the limit. They've been pushed and prodded and they've been told to, you know, hey, we gotta we gotta start acting like goats. We need to start moving this flock, you know, we need to start get get bigger, get more, get done and get on. And after a while, you know, some of the servants, you know, begin to look a little haggard. You know, you begin to notice that as you're driving those sheep, you know, a flock, if you push sheep fast enough, you start noticing one or two get lost along the way. My question to you is this, especially if you're a man of God watching this, or you're a shepherd, or you're a pastor, or you're a minister, how many have you lost? How many did you just write off because you said, oh, well, you know, they went their own way. They didn't stay with us because if they had stayed with us, they would have been of us. Did you stop your ministry long enough to say, oh, where did George go? What happened to George? How come George isn't here? Do I need to go see George rather than the 99 that are doing fine? Well, you know, if, they, if they're really a God, they'll come to my meeting. You know, they'll come to my Sunday morning service. They'll come to my, you know, they'll come to me. They'll come to me. But I won't go to them. And you see, that's where it kind of like, I'm sorry. If you want to see, if you want to be, if you want to do what God did, go to where they're at. You see, Jesus went to where the disciples were working. Jesus went to where the disciples lived. Jesus went where those 12 men had their being, everyday life, and he got involved in that part of their life too. It wasn't just about come to me on Sunday. And that's why a lot of the flock, is getting fleeced according to what the Word of God says because Keith Green made a very strong appeal to everyone about doing more and a lot of people were amazed by the music and the worship but he also said and he saw it that there were those that were like a sheep without a shepherd that 
the shepherd would lay down his life for the sheep, would care about the one that was lost, would care about each and every individual soul that was there. Every single person, not just to say a Hail Mary or a praise God or a thank you Lord or whatever it may be. And Oh, by the way, we have a prayer request for George. You know, George needs a shirt, you know, so we'll pray for him. Instead of like, hey, take off your shirt and give it to him. And that's the reality of where we need to be the, re, the, the object of God's direction, not the objection of what God is doing. Because God is saving the nation. God is saving the nation one soul at a time, one person at a time, one life at a time. He's saving you. And God blessed you with what you have. Enjoy that. But only in the ministry, when you start moving forward, begin to realize that you do your best and you pray that it's blessed. And Jesus takes care of the rest. It's not about works. It's not works of righteousness which you have done, but according to his mercy that he saved you. And you can only do so much because God wants sometimes you to do so little as to trust him more with what you do have rather than try to do more with what you don't have. What joy follows self-conquest? Oh, never mind. Read the wrong one. Turn out all thoughts of doubt and of trouble. Never tolerate them for one second. Bar the windows and doors of your souls against them as you would bar from your home against a thief who would steal in to take your treasure. What greater treasures can you have than peace and rest and joy? And these are all stolen from you by doubt and fear and despair. Face each day with love and laughter. Face the storm. Joy and enjoy joy. Peace and no peace. Love and be love. My great gifts. Follow me to find all three. I want you to feel the thrill of protection and safety even now in the midst of your storm. Any soul can feel this in a harbor, but real joy and victory comes to those who sense them when they ride a storm, when they're in the midst of the battle, when they are being attacked. Say all is well. Say it not as a vain repetition over and over again, all is well, all you know, all you know. But use it as you would a healing balm for your cut or wound. Do this and remember this, as from Keith Green. Do your best and pray that it's blessed. And Jesus takes care of the rest. That one I would say, sing over and over again. Until the poison is drawn out and until your wound is healed, then until then the thrill of fresh life floods your being. Until then, continue to do it till you know you have done your best. You have done all that you can. You have done everything and you're able to say with Paul, I have run the race, I have finished the course, there is laid up for me a crown in heaven. Don't go beyond that which God wants you to do, but recognize when to stop, to see, oh, wow, I'm bleeding. To take the moment and say, wow, Lord, you know, boy. And then when you're patching yourself up, you look around and you go, there's someone else bleeding. Then minister to them. But don't get too carried away with being caught up in the world and its ways, which always will want more, even in evangelical circles, even in the ministry, even in religious idealism, always pushes for more. Never says, well done. You never get that anymore. You have to find that balance within God that says, hey, stop. You're trying too hard. You're going too fast. Slow down. You're moving too fast. you got to make the morning last just kicking down the cobblestones. Well, that's the fun and feeling gravy. Oh, is that groovy? But you see, that idea of feeling groovy is moving according to the rhythm of what God is doing. And if you learn to dance, you learn to step out in rhythm, moving with the music, going with the flow, recognizing when God wants you to know what to do, where to go, and what to say. Because until he does, don't do it. Hey, if God hasn't said for me to be a part of it, I don't want to do it. I have wasted so much time in ministries and ministry 
often watching men spiel, spin their wheels, doing absolutely works of the flesh. And you know, every man lays a foundation, and every man builds a house, and every man does construction. And I've seen a lot of worthless, meaningless, personal construction in some people's lives that I just go, okay, you know, but I think I'll go live in my tent, you know. And I've been kind of like, you know, maybe the Abraham that, you know, there's a lot that people want to do, but I don't want to be Lot. There's a lot that people are doing in evangelical Christianity, but I don't want to be Lot. There's a lot that I could do, but I don't want to be Lot. I want to be Abraham. I want to have God visit me, you know, in the cool of the day. I want God to be coming past my tent to see me, you know. Ooh, wow, look at the Lord. Mm. Come on, Lord, have a, have, a, have a cup of coffee with me. Sit down, let's have a talk. Never mind, it's Sunday. I know you got churches to go to, but, you know, come, come visit me. You know, let's talk and visit for a while. And that's where we better recognize what's best according to being led by the Spirit of God as opposed to being driven by the fear of God. Because if you really want to be loved, you got to get in touch with the one that loves you. And when Jesus leads you, then you'll know when to go and sometimes when to stay.